world, the world's writers will walk through those gates. And uh, if you hang around, you get a chance to talk to them. I'm interested in conversations that deal with things that matter, that real, you know, how do we live our lives? First of all, make climate change personal in your life. The second step is get angry and get active. And the third step, and believe it or not, I think this is the most important. We have to imagine this world that we want to hurry towards. It's about kindness is looking at people as people and not as I voted this, I do this, whatever it is. There are some people we will never get along with, but most of us, most of us are a complex mass of different things. Hello, I'm Julia Donaldson. Some of you might know me from some of the books I've written, such as The Gruffalo or What the Ladybird Heard. Well, one of the things that I really love normally about coming to the Edinburgh International Book Festival is meeting children who love to read and bringing my stories to life for them on the stage. This year, of course, none of the authors or illustrators can do that. But I am delighted that this year's online book festival is available and free to so many children in so many different places. So I hope that anyone watching has a wonderful time and that it makes you want to read lots and lots of books. Hello everybody and welcome to the Edinburgh International Book Festival online. My name is Jolie and I am so excited to be here with not one but two super sleuth authors today, Robin Stevens and Shana Jackson. Now before we get started, I just want to let you know that there is a British Line Language interpretation option for this event, so there should be a little button on your screen if you want to watch with that option. Now I'm going to be talking to Robin and Shana today about all things murder mystery, and we're going to hopefully be hearing from them uh, reading a little bit of their latest books in both their series, and then there is going to be a chance for you to ask your questions questions at the end of the event. So again, there should be a little chat box on your screen. So if you've got anything that you really want to ask them, you can pop that in there and we should get that at the end. Okay, well, Robin Stevens is the author of the award-winning Murder Most Unladylike series, which has seen schoolgirl detectives Hazel Wong and Daisy Wells uncover several mysteries over the previous eight books, including some spin-off adventures. The series has sold over 700,000 copies worldwide and has been nominated for and won so many different awards that honestly, if I was to list them, then we would be here for the whole event. Uh, so you'll just have to take my word for it. But in their latest and last book, uh, Death Set Sales, Hazel and Daisy are hoping to enjoy a very fun and relaxing cruise along the River Nile. Unfortunately, they soon cruise right into another murder. Uh, but so, with danger in all directions, could this be the end of the detective society? Now, sometimes Shana Jackson works as an artistic director, and sometimes she lives on a boat. 
but most of the time she is the author of the High Rise Mysteries, where sleuth siblings Nick and Norva have to get to the bottom of some particularly odorous crimes on their home estate of the Tri. High Rise Mystery has just won the Waterstones Children's Book Prize. Congratulations, Shana. Uh, but now Nick and Norva are back in their second book in the series, Mic Drop. When pop star and former resident of the Tri, Trojak, is killed under very mysterious circumstances, the pair once again have to rely on their detective skills to crack the case. But as they say, if something's going down in the Tri, then these two know what's up. So, Robin, Shana, welcome to you both. Thank you so much for being here. And where are you both calling in from today? Robin, where are you coming from today? I am calling in from my study in my house in Oxford in nice. England. Nice. And Shana, where are you? I'm hoping you're going to say you're on your boat. I am indeed. I'm calling <laughs> in from my boat, Anna Maria, and she is moored in Rotterdam in the Netherlands. Lovely. So, Shana, do we have to call you, shall I call you captain for this? <laughs> if <event>? you like. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> captain Shana. <laughs> Very great. Now, um, this is my first time meeting both of you, um, but I understand you two are actually partners in crime, um, and not just because you're both award-winning murder mystery writers. Um, Shana, is it true that Robin is actually your editor for the High Rise Mystery? It's very true, yeah. and what a privilege that is. Can you imagine what that's like, being a debut author and having the Robin Stevens being your editor? It's brilliant, brilliant, amazing, Fantastic, scary, brilliant. Good. And is um is is Robin a good boss? I would say this is a safe environment, so you can you can be honest. <laughs> she, she is the absolute best. Um, her suggestions, her ideas, her thoughts just made High Rise Mystery and Mic Drop just incredibly strong, and I am forever grateful to her. That's great. And say, so what about for you, Robin? What's Shana like to work with? Is it really exciting? hearing all the new ideas she comes up with? It is. I remember uh, when she showed me the first uh, draft of High Rise Mystery and she talked about Nick and Norva for the first time and, and their first case. And I just felt the hairs on the back of my neck stand up and I knew that this was something really special. This was going to be an amazing book. Shana was an amazing author and it has proven to be the case. I have loved working with her on uh, two books so far. It has just been such a fantastic experience. Perfect, great. So the latest books for both of you, obviously we've got Death Set Sale for you, Robin, and it is sadly, yes, the last in the series. So what, what has it been like for you? Has it been a very emotional end? Yeah, it has been. Um, it's uh, the ending that I think is right for the series. Mm -hmm. It was right for the characters. I've known for a, a few years now that I needed to end that Daisy and Hazel's adventures couldn't go on forever mm -hmm. in this form. Um, but uh, having decided to give them a big send off, um, yeah, it was hard. I cried while I wrote Death mm -hmm. Set Sail. Um, it really was um, an immensely emotional book to work on, but a one that I think I worked particularly hard on as a result, and I'm particularly proud of now. Because it was, I think, um, I was. Uh, reading that it was about 10 years ago, was it, that you first came up with the idea for yeah. both of them? So, so it's, yeah. it's really sort of been a third of my life. Um, I had the idea, or I decided to sit down and write what became Murder Most Unladylike, the first story about Daisy and Hazel. When I was 22, it was 2010, I had just left university, I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. Um, and so I sat down and I wrote a book that was sort of based on my own school life and sort of based on my love for murder mysteries. Yeah. And I never thought it would be published. I never thought that anyone would, would actually want to read it. Uh, so I don't think my 22-year-old self would believe where I am 10 years yeah. later. But, uh, but yeah, it's, it's been a huge part of my life. And, and these characters really do feel like my friends at this stage. I'm not surprised. It's, it's a long time to be with someone. It's obviously such a personal journey for you as well. So I'm not, I'm not surprised you've said a, shed a few tears. <laughs> <laughs> and um, Shana, what about you? How was it coming back for the second uh, book, coming back to the try and with Nick and Norva? Was it really great getting back to them? Yeah, it was really ex it was really exciting to get back to them, and I kind of miss them. I, mm. I feel like they're you know to me they're really real, and um, I'm quite excited about what they do. It's like they have a life, 
yeah. of their own outside of me and I was like oh, I wonder what they've been up to while I've been away like what have they you know how have school been and what they've been doing around the time <laughs> but it's really nice yeah it was it was really um really great to come back to them okay that's good and um Robin was the last one being set in Egypt was that something you always knew was going to be the case for their last mystery um I don't think always mm. you know I initially couldn't imagine beyond like, one book um but for, for quite a number of years, yeah, um, as soon as I knew that I wanted to end the series, I knew that there was one mystery that I had to send, one place that they had to go, and that was Egypt, yeah. because I'm an author who grew up on Agatha Christie, and her death on the Nile, the book and the movie, have just been so incredibly foundational for me. I love, I love that story. Yeah. Uh, and so I knew that I wanted to send Daisy and Hazel on their own iconic Nile cruise um and it just felt like the biggest possible adventure to send the girls for their final mm -hmm. hurrah no i agree with that i love death on the nile is such a such a great one it's a classic and so shana what about you you know like robin's yeah come to the end with hers do you know what you have in store for nick and norva um like have you started planning out future mysteries for them and know how many there might be in the series i have so i I mean, in my head, there were many, many, many iterations of their stories. And in my head, I've definitely got around five. Mm -hmm. But it's it's a matter of, of time and pace um, and making sure that they get everywhere that they need to. Um, there are definitely some places I would like them to go. I would definitely like them to leave the try. I'm a yeah. bit concerned about the, you know, the amount of death in that place. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> how safe so, is uh, it there yeah <laughs> yeah i need to take them around and about a little bit and and one idea i'm working on is i used to live in sheffield mm. and um i think it'd be really great for the girls to go to the peak district because it's amazing oh, up there that would and be amazing oh i can imagine all that like the atmosphere of all the hills and that morning mist that would be that'd be great Great. Well, while we're talking about these two books, I wondered, yes, if you don't mind, um, if you could maybe read to us um, a little bit from them. Robin, do you want to start with, um, with something from Death Set Sail? Oh, I think we might have lost Robin. Is she, there's a good Shana, there maybe if, oh no, she's yep. back, she's back. I'm back. You're back, Sorry. you're there with us, Carol's no obliged. problem. No, 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 no. <laughs> Yeah, so Robin, yeah, I was just wondering if you wouldn't mind reading to us um, from a little bit from Death Set Sail, if that's okay. I would love to. Uh, internet willing. Let's see how we go. So this reading is from the very beginning of Death Set Sail, of course, the ninth and final murder mystery in the series, and it's the big ending. So uh, yeah, the very first chapter. This is an account of the last murder mystery the detective society will ever solve together. My name is Hazel Wong and I am heartbroken. I used to think that nothing could ever change. Not really, not with my best friend Daisy and me. The rest of the world could spin out of true and smash like a Christmas bauble on the floor, but still nothing would be able to touch us. We were Wells and Wong after all. We were the detective society and we always came out on top. But I see now that I got caught in the trick of thinking like Daisy. Her voice in my head and my own have become so mixed up by now that I hardly know which is which, unless I pause to think about it. And I never wanted to pause, not about this. And besides, Daisy promised me, she promised, I ought to be grown up enough now to know that the promises can be broken and that no one is safe and the myth of Daisy Wells the girl who can walk through mortal danger without even a scratch on her cheek is only that, a myth. I am beginning this account on the day before Christmas Eve at Daisy's home, Fallingford. The last time I was here for Christmas, there were enormous fires in every hearth, a gorgeously lit tree that stretched all the way up beside the great central staircase, and plates and plates of mince pies carried spiced and steaming from the kitchen by the Wells' maid, Hetty. But this Christmas is quite different. The house is cold and somehow still dark, no matter how many lamps and candles Chapman and Hetty light. Mrs. Doherty, the cook, has burned the mince pies and even the dogs look miserable. My littlest sister, May, tries to feed them biscuits, but they ignore her, so she shouts at them. I think I hate English Christmas, says my other sister, Rose, and I agree with her. But it isn't England I want to write about now, it's Egypt. The wide light of it, the sparks of sun off the Nile, the hum and churn of our cruise ship moving under my feet. 
and Daisy. From the moment we stepped into the cabin and saw the blood, I thought this was just another exciting adventure, another puzzle to solve, but I see now how wrong I was. I have held off writing up this case, but now, finally, I want to go back over those last days, our last murder mystery, to be with her again. Perhaps that way I can bring Daisy back to life. <laughs> Thank you. I have to say, when I read that, I was just like, uh, I, I was like, what a start. What a start for the end, I have to say. Yeah. So was... I, I cried writing it and I cried the first couple of times I tried to read that out loud. I've had to practice to get to this point. I, I can only imagine. And, you know, I, you know, Hazel said it there. It's like it's the last, the last mystery for them. Is it really? Is it going to be you have no plans to bring them back or... Well, um, I have decided to do something slightly different, and I've decided Ooh. to move the world forward about five years and um, focus on Hazel's little sister, May, who is mentioned in this extract. Yes. Uh, and May is going to be one of the three main characters in a new movie like activity, uh, which will be a World War II murder mystery series and uh, may or may not feature some other old favorites from this Good. series. It's gonna very much carry on from it. Yeah. Um, and that will be coming out, the first book will be coming out in 2022. And I have started to work on it, uh, or started to plan it in my head. And I'm really excited. I think it's gonna be fantastic. Great. Yes, I was gonna say, cause um, May was such a great character in this book. I love her just like popping up all over the place. So I'm glad, I'm glad that she's getting her own her own yes. series. Yeah. That's great. She's a, she's a character who, some characters just pop out of my head and I feel like they're real. And May was definitely one of those. And I felt like she deserved her own she is, you're like, you're not going anywhere. Yeah. So <laughs> might as well, yeah. <laughs> great. And um, Shana, yes, would you mind um, my reading to us a little bit from Mic Drop? That would be lovely. Absolutely. So Mic Drop is the second in the series. It follows a uh, Trosh Cap, who is a pop star who's come back to the try to record a music video. Okay. They didn't listen to me. If they had, perhaps this wouldn't be happening. Perhaps she wouldn't be looking me in the eye, her face twisted with terror as she succumbed to the inevitable. I will never forget that face. Never. Ketazina, Cat Clark, 23 better known as Troshkat. Her talent was undoubtedly on the rise, but her body was mere milliseconds away from a fatal fall. This former resident of the Tri was definitely about to die. Katazina fell. I stood still, frozen on the spot. My heart raced in my chest, 500 beats per minute. I didn't lean to look over the side. Why would I? Zero desire. There are exactly 0, 0.0 recurring reasons to witness her body meet the concrete. For what reason? No. Her expression was enough trauma. Enough trauma for an entire lifetime. Somewhere, in another dimension possibly, future me was thanking current me for this wise decision. Why were we here at all? How did all the small decisions we made through our lives lead us here tonight? Standing on the edge of a tower block with Katazina's film crew, her four friends and colleagues, witnessing a pop star lose her life. My sister and fellow investigator Norva had said, Nick, you defo have to be involved. It's going to be awesome. It was awesome in all the negative ways awesome could be. Wait, let me give you the facts. The Tri, better known as the Triangle, consisting of three tall towers called Corners, is the estate where we live. We, being Norva and I, and her best friend George. Tonight, we found ourselves on the roof of Corner 3. Many metres in the sky, overlooking the entire city, participating in a video shoot for Katazina's new song, Cusp. The song that was supposed to break her into the big leagues. Katazina's scream curdled my blood, twisted my stomach, implanted itself in my brain never to leave. It was followed by a smacking, echoing thud I would never forget. The worst sound I've ever heard. It was the rope that broke this evening, along with thousands of hearts and Katazina's body. Trojkat was dead. 
1956. A terrible, terrible accident, or so it seemed. That's what everyone else said, but not us. Ken, what an opening, it was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you both. I always say, I think it's just so lovely to actually be able to hear uh, the authors speak, you know, their own words. So thank you so much for reading. That's great. So I was thinking about how, um, often you hear about people talk about planning the perfect crime. And I was gonna ask you about planning the perfect crime book. And I wondered if you have any particular techniques that you use to sort of keep track of who's doing what um, at each time. Uh, so Robin, do you, do you have any tools that you use? So I'm a really sort of focused planner when it comes to the crime. The rest of the book, I don't plan very much. I might write a few bullet points, but the actual crime itself, I plan incredibly carefully. I write down who did it, how they did it, when they did it, uh, where they did it, who else was there, what all the clues were. And then I make a huge spreadsheet of all the different suspects and where they were at every five minute interval during the crime. Uh, and it's almost like I'm telling myself lots of short stories from each um, mm -hmm. each character's perspective. And that sort of huge master sheet um, I use to refer to as I'm writing the book. Um, it's because I think if I don't have, I know that if I don't have all of the details of the crime correct, I'll get confused um, and I'll start confusing the book and I'll confuse my readers. So yes, it's very important for me to plan very carefully. Yeah, I can imagine that, like as you're right, as soon as one thing slips and then you're tripping mm -hmm. yourself up and you've obviously got to already plant your sort of red herring false information on top of everything else. So that, that spreadsheet sounds sensible. Yeah, good plan. So, and Shana, what about you? Are there any particular tools that you use? So I am um, not as meticulous as Robin yeah. at all. And when I first met her, she showed me an example of a spreadsheet that she works on and it's incredible. And I did start to do that, but I also, I lost myself within the spreadsheet <laughs> as well. So I was like, oh, oh no. So uh, I, um, I do something similar, but way less detailed. And then I'm very fortunate enough to be able to have um, Robin to, double check on me. So I have like a fail save, which is so, so lucky. Oh, that's really good. Yeah, and um, I think I've heard you maybe mentioned before, Shana, I think is it something you call the three Ps that you use as your practice? So um, I just wondered if you could share those um, with the audience, because I just thought they were such great advice. Yeah, absolutely. So the three Ps are people, plot and place. So people are all the characters that you have in, in your mystery story. Of course, you have your detectives and you have your victim and you have your suspects and you have your culprit. But you also have the other people in the world who make the place interesting and rich and full. Um, and then you have the plot, which was Rob Robin was detailing. And for all those reasons, you know, if you don't know where your characters are at any point in time, then, you know, your very smart readers may think that they are the culprit. So it's so important to do that. Um, and then place, um, which is, you know, your setting. Um, mine is on a council estate. But I think I had some really great advice from Robin at the start, which was not to make it the, the scene of the crime too open so anybody could come through into that area you need to make it manageable and have like clear suspects so you the mystery is there for you to solve rather than it being just anybody because then that's just not fun and it's ridiculous so people plot and place those are the three p's okay. that i use and i don't use i tried because i'm quite scattery and 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 messy and just generally i like work on them at different times and think about them kind of mm. concurrently and then, you know, some days it might be, I might be more thinking about concrete because I do like concrete buildings. So I'm like, oh, yeah, this, I like that pebble dashing yeah. or whatever. And then, and then other days it will be right, focusing on characters. So actually, yes, while we're um, sort of just talking about characters and the detective duos you both have, um, they're both children uh, and normally like, you know, traditionally in crime fiction, there's always an, an, an adult who's, you know, the person solving the case. But do you think the fact that your protagonists are children gives them an advantage over adults? So I was thinking about how children see things that adults don't always, and they, they think about things in a different way. Um, so Shana, just yeah, while we're talking about characters, how do you feel about that? 
Yeah, I, well, I love writing for children. I love working for children. It's my favorite thing and it's a privilege. And I think children's characters are the, are the best because adults underestimate them all the time. Yeah. And children are listening to conversations you're having all the time. <laughs> and so they are, they have, they're having privileged information and they're walking around and you're just underestimating them and they're just gathering facts. And that's why I think they're just brilliant. They're just brilliant to have. A, they have a brilliant generally, but absolutely brilliant in murder mystery stories. You're perfect. Yeah, you're right. I think they are um, often discounted a lot, aren't they? So it's perfect. Like we've got, you know, with um, DCI Sharp is obviously just not interested at all in Nick and Norva. And you're just like, mm, that's just going to backfire on you. No, it is. <laughs> Let's get, and what about you, Robin? How do you feel about having children as the detectives? Yeah, I, I think, as Trina says, children are so underestimated by adults. Um, and I remember being a child and always watching and always spying and always thinking and trying to put together um, sort of clues as to what adults were doing. Um, and, you know, children are detectives. That's their default. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think they make fantastic, you know, murder mystery detectives. And um, as Shrena says, it is such a privilege to write for kids. Um, it's so much fun to write about young detectives. I think their perspective yeah. is so interesting and so different from an adult perspective and um, very effective at solving murders. Yeah, definitely. Well, to met the three Ps, we've talked about characters and the people. Um, place, and I was thinking about the scene of the crime and how you've got very specific settings for these books. We've got the Tri Estate, and I know the last one was set obviously in Egypt, but Deep Dean's been like, you know, a really important feature of the series. Um, so I just wondered, yeah, what was it about those settings in particular that made you want to set the stories there? Um, so Robin, maybe could ask you a bit about Deep Dean as a school? So um, I'm an author who really, I like to know the place um, that I'm writing about. And I think actually Sharna is, is the same. The re research she did on the try, the way she imagines it is so detailed. And I think that's quite similar to the way I work. Um, and I write about Deep Dean and even, I guess, even Egypt book, um, because I, I went to Deep Teen. I, my school basically was okay, Deep Teen, yeah. but not in the 1930s and no murders. No murders. Um, <laughs> and it's really important to me to have been to the place that I'm writing about. And the first draft of Death Set Sail just wasn't good. It didn't have that spark to it. And I realized that was because I hadn't been to Egypt yet. I hadn't been on the Nile on a cruise ship. And I went in January this year mm -hmm. as I was working on the second draft and it just clicked everything into place. I could see it, I could see it like a film in my head suddenly. I knew how the characters would move around the boat and I just unlocked everything and I could write. Um, so yeah, Deep Dean, knowing that place, having mm. lived there for five years, um, remembering it so clearly is a huge part of why I wanted to write the book and why I keep sending Hazel and Daisy back to Deep Dean because it's a place that means a lot to me and I can really visualize it clearly. Sure. Now, I, I was going to ask you that earlier, actually, if you'd been to Egypt, because that opening description and the way you talk about Cairo and the Nile, I was just like, so evocative. So yeah, that, that answers that I question <laughs> for me. Yeah, and then Shana, what about you with the Tri then? What was it about the Tri estate that you knew that you wanted to be the setting for your series? So for me, I'm really interested in, in estates for a number of reasons. I didn't grow up on an estate when I was a child, but I lived in a city, well, if it wasn't a city, it's a town called Luton, which had estates and I'd go and visit my friends on them. And what I loved about estates was just the, the camaraderie and the community yeah. aspects. And um, I feel that estates get a, a terrible, have a terrible reputation for for events that happen there but actually there is there are some really great things happening within communities that need celebrating and to me a tower block is basically a vertical village and it's that's why it's so interesting all these kinds of people who are from very different backgrounds living together in a kind of small space or small space my gosh my, my language today and that's why i really find it interesting and also I touched on it earlier, but I really do like buildings and architecture and my favourite buildings are like brutalist concrete buildings and living in London at the time, being able to go to them and see them and think about how they were constructed and what kind of plot of land it might be built on and why and when was really interesting to me. I think I, I love doing the research on the try. I think, yeah, I, 
that might be my favorite bit favorite part of it that's great i love that um you're right though being like a, a vertical village that's um such a good point and you're right no that's that's really great um, the, the other thing, and actually you've sort of just did touch on it there, um, Shana, that I wanted to ask you about, was what I was calling the neighbourhood watch, and that was the sense of community um, that I think was strong in both of these books. You know, again, it's like, it's not just the central duo. They have like a strong support cast of characters behind them that they, you know, can rely on and, and work with. And I wondered for both of you, again, was that something that you felt was very important for them, that they weren't they weren't just on their own. So Shana, you sort of just touched on that, the community of the estates that you've seen in the past. Yeah, for me, it was it was incredibly important, especially because they're two young black girls uh, who don't, whose mother isn't around. I really wanted to show that, you know, their dad is very interested in their lives and other people within the estate also kind of know what they're up to. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that was incredibly important for me. Yeah. And Robin, what about you? With like, you know, there's obviously you know, Hazel and Daisy are best friends at school, but they've got their other school friends as well with them. And obviously some of them come with them on the, on the cruise as well. Yeah, so um, again, my school experience was so much about the friends that I made there. Um, most of the kids I went to school with were boarders. We all, you know, we lived at school during the term. We didn't go home to our families. And that makes you really rely on your friends. Your friends become your family. Uh, and I really wanted to show that in Daisy and Hazel's relationship, um, you know, in a way, just like Nick and Nova, they are sisters. Um, and, you know, they have an incredibly strong friendship group who will always have their back, even if they argue, you know, which is the rest of their dorm. Um, so, yeah, I really when I created Daisy and Hazel and their friends, I was thinking about my own friendship group yeah. uh, and I was trying to give that closeness and that sense of community uh, to them. Love it. Oh, great. And um, again, Shana, okay, you sort of just touched on this, but something else I want to talk to you about um, was the usual suspects in children's books. Because um, I read an interview with you recently about how um, you said a lot of the time when uh, books for children do feature like characters of colour, a lot of the time they're about um, social justice issues or, you know, like they've always got to be about something and never the characters just have a chance to just have fun or, like you say, to solve mystery or magic. Um, and again, was that sort of what drew you, Shana, to wanting to write these books to begin with? Absolutely. That was absolutely in my mind. And I'm so fortunate to be published by Knights of Mm. who are all about bringing diversity into 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 books and into publishing and not just you know black female diversity but, but diversity of all kinds and it's really important for me that all children can see other children being brilliant and yeah. this morning has been quite sad because um because of the death of Chadwick Boseman this morning who who is Black Panther um and Black Panther it was one of those experiences that showed the importance of representation and how it was received, received by not only the children who were completely thrilled, but by adults going back to the cinema for the first time in like 30 years. That was my dad. He just never goes out. Well, he goes out, but not to the cinema. But going back to the cinema and everybody rallying around a representation that they've been looking for. And um, it's incredibly important. It's incredibly important for me to to show a different kind of experience. There's nothing wrong with those the social justice, no, but yeah. and absolutely not. And it's just you know because that is very much a reflection of reality for some people. But also, it's you know outside of um, being black, it's just it's you know you are a person too who has lots of interests and and hobbies. And it's really important to show that experience too. Exactly, you're right. Like it's, it's obviously important to recognize that, but life doesn't end there for people. So I think um, I read, um, this is what I did admit to you both, I've been stalking you uh, ahead of this event. And I, I read, I think it was after a school visit you did, Shana, and um, one of the children was saying that they never really read before High Rise because they just never could connect with any of the characters that they came across. So. I, I think it's true, and you're right, like about Chadwick Boseman and Black Panther, like seeing that effect that it has on people. And it's, yeah, I, I just think it's fantastic. So, and, and again with you, Robin, like with, um, I think it's, I, I can't exactly 100% remember 
you know, the, this line from the first uh, Murder Most Unladylike, but Hazel says something about like, you know, who would ever expect there to be a Chinese Sherlock Holmes? And, and, and there is now, you know, yeah. because of you. And again, was that, was that something that, again, you really wanted to make sure that that... Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I think that I was, even as a child, I was struck by the disconnect between the world I saw around me, my friends, my, my family, and the world I saw in books. Um, you know, school stories that I read, every single person was white. Every single person, like, you know, looked like me. Um, but nobody sounded like me because they all had to be English. Mm. Um, and I was born in America. And then, you know, I went to boarding school and you know, he, my friends came from all over the world, so many different backgrounds, so many different countries. You know, I came from America um, and I didn't feel like our diversity, you know, just in life was being reflected in books. And it's something that I wanted to do in the first book. And I sort of pushed myself more and more to do, um, you know, as my world has expanded, as I've met more and more of my fans. I think, you know, everyone deserves the chance to see themselves in a book and see themselves being heroic and being important, um, you know, we're all the heroes of our stories. And I think it's really important and really great um, to, to see that, you know, reflected in books and media. Um, but as, you know, as Sharna says also, um, it's, you know, it's not enough to just have books that are diverse. You have to have authors from a diverse um, range of backgrounds and experiences as well, because it's that moment when, you know, you can look at, at somebody being successful who looks like you, who acts like you, who talks like you. It, it's life changing. It matters so yeah. much, um, and yeah, no, I think that's why you know what Knights of it are doing is doing are doing um, is so fantastic. They're really um, you know sort of working to pull in voices that wouldn't normally be heard um, and let them tell fantastic stories. And I think it's yeah. very necessary. It is. No, you're right, and it is necessary. And I think particularly with younger readers, you know, as well. And it's like they're starting out in the world, and they they need to be shown how it should be, you know? Yeah. So I think that's, that's honestly, it's really great. Um, so I just wanted to ask you a little bit, again, I'm sort of drawing back to these detective duos um, with Hazel and Daisy and Nick and Norva. Um, the way they work together, it did really remind me of like Holmes, like Sherlock Holmes and Watson and then Poirot and Hastings. And were they, those sort of classic murder mysteries, quite an influence for you, again, when you were coming up with these stories? Um, Shana, were they for you? Yeah, they were. They were. And it's, for me, it's a, not necessarily scientifically, but I needed to have, like, two characters who would contrast and conflict with each other but still get on. And there, so there had to be a bit of a, you know, a push and a pull between them and yeah. a bit, be a bit opposed. Um, but yeah, I did absolutely look to the classics for some guidance there. Yeah, great. And, and how about you, Robin, for you as well? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, I was raised on Agatha Christie and Sherlock Holmes and um, just, you know, so many fantastic, Dorothy Sayers, like so many fantastic um, murder mystery authors. And I wanted to create characters who were reminiscent of that, sort of the, the duos, yeah. um, but were also like the friends that I had. And, you know, often in friendship, especially when you're younger, you have the leader and the follower, you have, you have the Holmes and you have a Watson. Um, and sort of the joke of my series, I think, or sort of the, the in-joke is that Daisy thinks that she is yeah. Holmes and Hazel is Watson. And of course, Hazel is... Holmes uh, and so is Daisy or Hazel is Poirot and Daisy is Watson um, and you know the whole the books are sort of showing uh, Daisy more and more that actually Hazel's her equal rather than her little sort of follower apprentice um, yeah. but yeah so I was definitely riffing off sort of the the classic detective duo idea yeah they were and and I think that's right and I remember reading something with you before Robin where you were saying that and it's very much this series is about not only yeah Daisy learning that she isn't the center of the world, yeah. even though, yeah, she might think she is. But also importantly, I think for Hazel, just to learn to come out of herself and to kind of have that faith in her abilities. And yeah. yeah, because, you know, I think that that's, I mean, something that, you know, I remember when I was younger, I was so unconfident. I was so shy. I was so sure that all my friends were better than me. 
and I had to learn as I got older that actually, you know, I have a lot to give and I can be heroic and I can be important. And, and I wanted Hazel to have that journey. And by, um, you know, by this book, she realizes that she is also the hero of the yeah. stories um, and that she is equally as important as Daisy. And that was, yeah, an important sort of thrust of the narratives. Yeah, no, I think you're right. It's, it's a really hard lesson to have to learn, I think. And I think we're all guilty of that. And it, it takes time. So I think, you know, having these books where it's like, shows you it's like it's okay it's okay to to doubt yourself but don't don't do it too much you know and these things will be all right great so i'm keeping an eye on the time because i'm aware that i um we will probably have lots of audience questions coming in so i have uh, just a couple of sort of quick fire questions um for you and the first one is if you were ever given a murder to solve, which fictional detective would you most like to work with? Um, Robin, we'll go to you first on that one. I would say Miss Marple. I think she is um, a very good student of humanity. And I, I think that generally she's the person who's sitting in the corner and will just drop the real real solution and just, you know, yep. keep knitting. Whereas Poirot is very bombastic and, and so is Holmes. But I think Miss Marple will get straight to the point. Straight to the point. And I think you'd be able to have some good like afternoon teas out with her as well, yeah. I think, while you discuss such things. Yeah. <laughs> and how about you, Shana? How about you? Um, outside of um, Hazel, I would say Jessica Fletcher for Murder, She Wrote. Yes. yes. <laughs> We'd have such a good time. Yes, both gone, both gone for the older ladies, you're right. There's none of this sort of Poirot showboating where everyone has to be gathered around and it's like its own performance no. and everything. Yeah, and then the other uh, question I wanted to ask you is what unsolved mystery from real life would you love to get to the bottom of? And Shana, what about for you for that one? Oh, that's a really, really good question. Oh, I'm so many, so many out there as well. <laughs> yeah, for me, oh, I'm really interested in what happened to Flight MH170 Ooh, and yes. where, where, what happened there. Yeah. So I think that might be um, where I would go. Yeah, go for that. And how about you, Robin? Uh, I have. I have. I mean, I could go for hours. I love this uh, <laughs> topic, but uh, the two I think that I'm really interested in at the moment or historically have been um one is the road hill house murder uh which is sort of um victorian murder that kind of kicked off the country house murder mystery genre in fiction um and i just i think i know what happened but i just want to know for sure i want to know if i'm right um because i have a very clear idea of who i think did it oh, oh no we might oh no she and oh i'm my back yes you're back. and also the Somerton man um, which is an Australian uh, unsolved mystery mm. from the 40s, 50s, I think. Um, a man was found dead on a beach um, with no identification, no identifying marks at all, and we just don't know who he was and why he died. And I, I really want to know. No, just all these, all these unsolved cases. I'm just thinking there's so many out there. I was like, oh, I'd <laughs> love personally to know what what's going on at like Area 51. That's what I want. Yeah. To, <laughs> that's, yeah. that's what I want to know. <laughs> Um, anyway, yes, so um, I will have a quick look on our on this very fancy tablet. And yes, we have got lots of questions coming up here from our lovely audience. Um, oh, OK, this is a good one from Maya. She wants to know, have you ever solved a mystery? Even, I think this is uh, for you, Robin, even if it is just one like solving the mystery of Lavinia's missing tie. Um, so yes, yeah, so Robin, have you ever solved any mysteries in real life? Um, I have never solved any murders, and apparently there's a rumor going around my school now that when I was there, I, I solved a murder every year. Um, not <laughs> true. Into that, I would, but, I would go with that. <laughs> you no, know, it sounds great, doesn't it? Yeah. But in real life, not fun uh, to solve murders. Um, I have solved small mysteries, mm -hmm. like um, we had a chocolate ice cream thief at university, mm -hmm. uh, and I solved that one with my friend. Um, but but nothing bigger than that, just sort of small. Um, but I'm very good at solving uh, the mysteries of, uh, in um, other TV shows, films, books. I'll start watching. Um, I started watching a TV show um, a couple months ago with my husband and the first scene. And I was like, that's what happened. And he was like, that's ridiculous. <laughs> and then after 10 episodes, the big twist was that that was yeah, what I, had happened. I, t I told you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Are you? Uh, yes. Yeah, does your um, does your husband just ban you now from watching any any murder mystery shows He's with him? He's just like, stop spoiling it because <laughs> yeah, I, I know. Yeah. Uh, how about you, Shannon? Have you ever solved any any real life mysteries? 
Um, really small ones like, you know, where are all my socks? Um, <laughs> why am I still hungry? Um, but, um, we did, there was this case, there was a case once where my friend, um, my friend's boyfriend, his sister was acting very suspicious um and her her stories weren't adding up so we did do our research and got some receipts of our own we called we called around uh put on different voices <laughs> and we got to the bottom of that situation um which was incredibly fun amazing um, but yes oh great well um shine i might have to come and get you to solve the mystery of where are all my socks because <laughs> i'm having a big sock crisis at the moment so i'll need your help with that um okay let's see um, oh, actually, this one, so this is from Nora, close to Nora. She wants to know, for both of you, how do you come up with the names um, for your characters? And have you named any of them after someone you know in real life? Um, so, Robin, how did you come up with Daisel and Hazel? D D Daisel? I, Daisel and Hazel, that's what my, I, uh, that's like I'm always saying Daisel shipping, and Hazel. Yeah, yeah, their shipping name, that Hazel. Yeah. <laughs> Hazy. Um, Hazy and Norka. Well. <laughs> Norka, that's yeah. good. Um, so Daisy and Hazel, I don't know where those names came from. They were in there so early that I have completely forgotten at this stage. I think they're both sort of floral, natural names. They went together in my head. Um, but everyone else, I take bits from real people. I take bits from sort of favorite characters in, in books. Lavinia is named after a character in a book, an American children's book called I, Lavinia. Um, and... Yeah, um, Beanie, her last name is taken from the last name of a boy I went to primary school with. Mm -hmm. And after the book came out, he emailed me and was like, is this me? <laughs> and I had to be like, no, it's only your name. Um, but only I once named a character after a sandwich I was eating because I just, you run out of, you run out of names. You run out of ideas. Like I just start scrolling Twitter or just look around. I named a character after coffee, um, Jane. Oh, she's desperate. Um, so yeah, it's hard. <laughs> <laughs> so wait, which, who was the sandwich character? A uh, doctor sandwich. Doctor's. Oh, okay. So it wasn't. <laughs> I was. Is there going to be like a literally new <laughs> character that I've forgotten about no. or something? Like, in, in first class murder. Yeah. I love that. That's so good. What about you, Shana? Where did Nick and Norva come from as names? Okay, so Norva was Norva was named after an artist I met in a gallery in the Hague. And she was this really cool sculpture, sculptor. And she had a show and I met her and we had this really nice meeting. And I was like, yeah, she was like a, a grandmother I wish I had. Mm. Um, so I called Nor name Norv after her. Uh, Nick's full name is Annika um, or Anika. And there was a girl I went to school with with that name who I liked. Um, and in High Rise Mystery, the victim is called Hugo Knightley Webb. Um, and Knightley and Webb are two ex-boyfriends. Oh, got the... <laughs> we won't ask you any more about that. <laughs> but they both know and they love it. So it's great. Oh, that's good. Yes, because actually it's fit with all the names and I love that there's a George in both of your books and they are just so different. Like, and I, I was actually going to ask you this before if you'd ever considered doing a little mashup uh, book together with both of those, um, I both think the they'd Georges. Be friends. Yeah, I feel like our Georges would connect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was either like a murder most savage or something like yeah. as, a, as a series. <laughs> I was like, I would read it. I would. I'd love to read oh, that. That's amazing. Series. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> Um, but we've got um, from Asha. So these, these questions are really good, by the way. I think we've got some future chair people out there. Um, Asha wants to know what fact about your characters most surprised you when you were writing about them? Um, so Robin, was there anything, anything that took you, took you by surprise? Oh my goodness, I'm just trying to think about this. Um... It's, hard, I, it's really hard to think. Yeah. I I think that my character surprised me, but sort of on a very micro level. Like I might be surprised when Hazel steps up and says something brave in one of the books yeah. or, um, you know, when Daisy reveals that she's a bit sort of anxious about something. And that will sort of surprise me like I'm talking to a friend and they mm -hmm. say something like, oh, really, are you? I didn't know. Um, but I don't know if, Anything that surprised me. So, I mean, like, I think thinking harder and harder about both 
Daisy and Hazel's families made me sort of quite sad because they have quite sort of difficult yeah. family lives. Um, possibly Hazel's little brother was a bit surprising when I realized that she had a little brother. Um, but but it's more like ha- having friends and chatting to them and being sort of micro surprised by by the things they say to you. And I think that's sort of what we were talking earlier about how like long you've been with these characters and Shana, the way that you, you know, also connect and talk with Nick and Norva as well. Like they are like people in your lives. So it must be quite funny when you're right, you're writing them. You're like, oh, you, that's how you feel today, is it? And yeah. <laughs> oh, so, yeah, Shana, what about you? Is there anything that surprised you with your characters? So uh, my, my answer absolutely mirrors Robin's, but for Mike Drop, I was surprised at um, Katazina's attitude. So yeah, when I, when I, she, yeah, I can't spoil it, yeah, but okay. she's, um, she's an interesting person. Yeah. Did you, so she, did she change a bit from when you started out writing the book? Did she... Sort of, yes. Yeah, she did. She was she was um, more positive. Okay. Yeah. Mm. Good. All right. Very, good. Very intriguing. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Hard to, hard to answer that one. Yeah. No, it is, isn't it? I say without the no spoilies, as they yeah. say. Um, oh, but well, uh, let's see. <laughs> this is a good one as well. Okay, for both of you, um, from Arane, I think. Uh, where is the weirdest place you have ever done your writing? Uh, like, e.g., I like these examples, in the toilet or in, in a pool. <laughs> so, how Not about... Pool. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, Robin, do you often write from the loo? Is that a... I, I never do, actually, <laughs> weirdly. I'm quite um, pleased to hear that. <laughs> I, yeah, I know, lucky. When I started out, um, I wrote the first... The second and third book, I had another job. I had a full-time job as an editor in London and I lived in Cambridge. And so I would travel, commute in every day on the train and I would sit down. I would like run onto the train to get a seat, sit down, open my laptop, start typing. And I so I got really good at sitting with like a business person right next to me, <laughs> like craning over as I was like typing. And then the murder happened. So that was, I thought it was weird for them. Um, for uh, Death Set Sale, I wrote some of it on the Nile. I was sitting on the Nile, um, writing it, writing about being on the Nile. And that was kind of weird inception vibes. Mm. Um, but, but yeah, I can write anywhere. I've trained myself really well. And Shana, how about you? Um, um, have I written on the toilet? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I mostly write, well, I write in, in my boat, if that's, if that's, weird um only there yeah i don't think many authors would have a boat they write on so i think i'd own that one (laughs) okay yeah so writing on a boat that's yeah that's my favorite place um but i write a lot from bed as well to be quite honest i that's my favorite place i've got my laptop up here and just nice and comfy water yeah great okay um oh okay um this one is from emily uh, for both authors, this is for both of you, which characters do you enjoy writing the most? So, Shana, how about you for this? Who's your favourite to write? Um, I really, well, uh, well, I love them all. I do like writing George because yeah. he just makes me laugh. <laughs> and um, he is like an alternate reality version of my brother. Like, he's nothing like my brother at all. But my brother is like, this is what you think I am. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that just makes me laugh my brother is nothing like that but yeah I I don't know like he um I sound like a medium but he comes through very clearly sometimes <laughs> and it's just so easy to, to to write like him so I do like writing George sure. but I love you know I love Nick and Norbert I love Nick uh, well I, love, I, can't, I can't choose between them it's my, too hard my, isn't it yeah yeah I love them all. how about you Robin um, weirdly, I'm also going to say my George. I think there's something about Georges for us. Like, I, yeah. Sharon is Sharon is George is one of my favourites um, to read, and mine is one of my favourites to write. He's just just such a yeah, like complete character. I remember like, making him up and just him turning up in a room and thinking, I know this person. Um, also, Daisy is great because she always says these sort of completely like ridiculous <laughs> uh, over the top things. I think she's really fun. Um, and also May, uh, Hazel's little sister is 
so much fun that I'm writing a whole series about May. Um, but yeah, sometimes characters just come out of your head and you're just like, I can't believe this person isn't real. I know them. I've met them. And just, and, yeah, writing themselves almost, yeah. I imagine. Yeah. But this, this is what I'm saying. We need to do this George and George yeah. book together. You obviously both love writing your Georges. So <laughs> do that. OK. Um, OK, Colette wants to know if you could write yourself as a character into one of your books, what role would you like to play and why? As in, like, would you want to be a detective in the story? Would you want to be a suspect? I was going to say victim, but I was like, no one probably wants to be <laughs> the victim in these books. But um, Robin, how about for you? Which, which role would you like to take on? I would be Aunt Lucy, um, who is sort of like a mentor character mm. to the girls um, and is training them up more and more in sort of detection and spycraft. And um, I mean, I guess it's a bit similar to me as the author. Um, but yeah, I'd be a sort of friendly, older character who's who's there to help out. Okay. And how about you, Shana? I think I would be, from High Rise Mysteries, uh, Mrs. Kowalski. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> she's an older lady and she's just really like strong and like shady. And I just love that energy. And I would like, I think maybe I'd take it further and, you know, actively give them disinformation for fun just to watch them scramble and just like meddle with their investigation, but not in any kind of insidious way. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And um, Lucio wants to know, uh, what murder mysteries would you recommend um, for readers? So, um, Shana, again, what, what books would you recommend for young readers? Um, well, obviously, everything that Robin's written. Um, <laughs> um, oh, Agent Zainab. Agent Zaiba. Yeah, Zaber Investigators, that's really good. Um, Detective Dot stroke, stroke Agent Asher is a newish one. Agent Asher has just come out by Sophie Dean. That's really, really nice as well. I, mean, I guess it depends on the age group. Mm. But, you know, Robin is the perfect person to answer this because she has the best knowledge. <laughs> so, Robin, what would you, um, what books would you recommend? Is this where the, like, massive list drops down? I mean, now? yeah, but, I mean, <laughs> genuinely, the thing I always say is Sherna Jackson's books, High Rise Mystery and Mic Drop, are really great. Um, they are. They're so fantastic. Um, Serena Patel is not murder mystery. It's a bit younger, um, but so funny. Anisha Accidental Detective is the first one. Um, for slightly older kids, um, A Good Girl's Guide to Murder by Holly Jackson is really, really good. Um, Catherine Woodfine's books are good. They're sort of the same age group as both of our books. Um, you know, for someone sort of 12, 13 plus, um, Agatha Christie, Death on the Nile mm -hmm. and um, uh, Murder on the Orient Express are both good. I would say good ways to start and the body in the library as well. Oh, yes. um, yeah, although slight note of caution on that, there are some attitudes that aren't great are problematic so if you're going to read that read it with an adult to talk through the issues um that you find in Agatha Christie but but yeah lots of really good stuff out there I think no there is um I'm just aware that we're running out of time and there's so so many good questions oh, no. here um one um, from Feraleith. I hope I've said your name right. And I'm a bit worried about asking this so late because I feel like this is a whole other event um, conversation. But she was saying that um, a lot of in other books, like I think you read in murder mystery sort of ones for children, uh, you don't often hear or get the description of finding the dead body. Um, whereas we obviously do in, in both your books. Um, and she wondered sort of when did that change, do you think? And have you sort of ever had any pushback from from parents about sort of dealing with this topic? So, Robin, have you? Um, I mean, I think I was the first children's book that was actually a murder mystery for children. Mm -hmm. uh, and I we had to be fairly careful because it hadn't been done before. And I also don't really like writing about like the graphic details of discovering the body. Uh, so I generally have somebody like quickly push down the stairs and there they are and they're dead and then it's over. Um, I'm much more interested in solving the puzzle. Yeah. But I think Sharna can go much further than I can. I, I think that, um, I think that your descriptions are, are scarier. Yeah. They're, but, but they're even so good. Reading my opening, because, because of, um, the lockdown I haven't been reading it that much so when I read it myself I was like Ooh, that's, that's a bit much and I think actually working with Robin we 
we work quite hard on that on those bits like trying to push it and trying to like define where the boundaries are because I agree it's not really about it's not well, it's not about the gore yeah I mean you need an element of that but you know that's not what a murder mystery is about for for me it's yeah, a, yeah it's it's the the working it out and I, I think I remember you saying once before, Shana, and something that is for you, it's very much about the justice too. And it's for these characters who've done these wrongs to get to get caught and get found out and, and stopped, yeah. I think. And the justice served by the kids. Yeah, that's the exactly. One. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. It's, it's about solving the case, not, not the body. Not, not yeah. the committing the crime, no. definitely. <laughs> that's a good, good note to end on. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm really sorry. We are out of time just about. So I just want to say um, a few thank yous. Um, one to uh, Bailey Gifford for their sponsorship of the Children's Book Festival programme this year. I think um, a lot of us were worried at the start of the year that there might not be one. So we're really pleased um, that we could still go ahead. Um, thank you also to Jo Ross for her amazing uh, interpretation interpretation skills that she's done for this event. And thank you to Robin and Shana for both of you for being here with us today. And um, the books that they have been talking about uh, are available in the book festival's independent bookshop. There is a link to that just on your screens as well. They really thought of everything this year. It's all right there for you. But I think that is just about case closed from us. Um, so thank you everybody for watching. It's been so lovely having you here. Stay safe everyone, bye. Bye. Bye.